let's uh, make a start. So where we uh, where we left off was um, this is the structure of the O'Farrell pedigree uh, from six roughly from about 1300 onwards. Question is, is this uh, structure seen in the DNA? And the short answer is no. And I'm going to run through these slides. We have our O'Farrell pedigree based on our heart, which in turn was based on Roger O'Farrell's Linea Antiqua. Is this structure of the different Farrells, the Farrell Bon, the Farrell Bui, is it seen in the DNA results? Short answer is no. But in order to get there, I had to take the DNA values of all 46 members of the project. I had to download them into a CSV file. I had to upload them into the SAP program choose the file, click on the execute button. I then had generated a family tree for the O'Farrells, and this is the family tree of the O'Farrells of Anna Lee. <coughs> now, this in turn had to be massaged by using the S845 model, adjusting kit haplotypes to fit, adding limited SNP data, um, the MDKA surname and birth location, <coughs> coloring the boxes, forcing all Farrells below BY28646, and the resulting mutation history tree is currently the best fit for the O'Farrells of Group 2, given the data we have to date. And this is what it looks like, with pretty colors added. <laughs> and you can see I can hardly fit it on the screen. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take you through the various branches. This branch over here, was uh, their common ancestor goes back to about 1450. Branch B, about 1450. C and D go back to 1550, and then branch E goes back to 18, 1800, this group here, and branch F goes back to uh, 1900. So they're very closely related uh, in, br in branch F. If we just look at the top, this is what it looks like at the top. These are the dates. The, um, this common ancestor was born about 350 AD. Why is that? Because these are the pharaohs on this side, these are, this, these are the two Yorks. Mm. So the connection between the Farrells and the Yorks is about 350 AD. There's Nolan as well, another adjacent back branch with Roderick. And again, common ancestor about 350 AD. These dates have to be taken with a big pinch of salt. I'm sure there are mistakes in this best fit tree. It is not an accurate um, reflection of reality, but it's the best reflection of reality we have given the data that's currently available. Uh, like I say, in the best ideal world, everyone would do the big Y, everybody would upgrade to 111 markers, then we'd have a much more accurate best fit family tree. <coughs> but the best fit only relies on the data we have available. So that's the very, very top of the tree, and we can ignore the Yorks and the Nolans. We're interested in the Farrells, which are all of these ones down here. Let's look at branch A. Branch A, here are the dates, 1450. They're all 1450. <clears throat> so everybody in Branch A goes back to um, a, an ancestor that was born about 1450. This should be a huge branch because uh, the, we, we're not seeing 1700, 1800. We're, they're all going back. So they're actually all very distantly related to each other within this Branch A. Uh, branch B, this one over here, again 1450, there's only two people, one of them goes back to Longford. <coughs> branch C, or branch, uh, yeah, branch C is in two parts. Now we're getting some di differentiation. Um, this is all going back to 1550, uh, but this is the, um, the person here who has the pedigree that goes back to 1640. So he's actually in branch C. And does that 1640 pedigree, does it go back to a Farrell Bourne? Does it go back to a Farrell Bui? Do we know that for, do we know, John? Does um, the, the, the longest pedigree, in the, it, does it go back it's, to a Bourne or Bui? It, it, again, it's, it's one that straddles kind of geographically. Yeah. It's, it's, it's between the two. Now you mentioned I geographically, know, and that's- person, <coughs> I know person, I know they have, um, in one stage in the 1600s, a Farrell married a Farrell. Yeah. What, the, on the maternal side, there are farrells who are definitely connected with the Morning Castle, with the castles, makes them boys. On the other side, I don't know. Perhaps it would be interesting if we actually put in the 
townlands that the most distant known ancestor came from, that might give us a better clue of whether they're bones or bwees, or it might tell us nothing. Uh, it's very, very difficult to say. You don't know what you're going to learn until all the data is in. And that's why this kind of, this exercise is a, it's a hopeful exercise, it's an optimistic exercise, it's a shot in the dark exercise a lot of the time. But um, we are not able to distinguish the bones from the wheeze and the various other lines based on the data so far. This is branch D over here. Branch D includes a Farley. Uh, you can see the various dates here now. We're getting 1550 uh, going down to 1800 on this branch and then 1700 going down to 1850. So it looks like branch D splits into two sub-branches fairly early on. And then we have a look at branch E. Here we have Longford Farrell. Uh, they go back to 1800. Uh, they've only tested to 37 markers, but uh, they're very closely matching at that level. So they should compare their pedigrees. This is a group where they might actually be able to make that genealogical link using paper records. So these people should all be collaborating with each other and should be exchanging emails and comparing their feral pedigrees. If we look at the last one then, branch F, these people are all related in the 1900s. They've tested to 111, 111, 67, 67. There are, these are exact matches. So this may be a family that already knows the relationship between each of them. So that's the, the best fit tree for, uh, for group two. Does it match the ancient annals? It's too early to say. Um, we need more information about the most distant known ancestor, including the birth location, the town on of birth, and uh, we need more pedigrees posted on the Post Your Pedigree page on the blog. And we need more big Y and Y111 data to get that fine detail to answer the question, can we actually define a sub-branch genetic signature for each of those branches of the O'Farrells uh, identified in the ancient annals? I'm going to, so the Farrell group two summary, the dominant surname variant is Farrell. Uh, the grouping appears accurate, except we are getting chance matches to York and Nolan. Um, there are several examples of surname or DNA switches where there has been um, uh, 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 the, the Farrell Y DNA has become associated with a different surname. They are from Longford, according to the most distant known ancestor information. The group goes back to maybe the 1400s. Uh, the, this is the branch of the tree of mankind, which is a three snip block. So there's three SNP markers together. They all go back to there. We're only going back to 1450. What happened for the 450 years before that? Are we, supposing the first O'Farrell invented the O'Farrell name, and then um, there was a surname or DNA switch immediately after that. Now, that doesn't look to be the case because we have that genetic link to the Reynolds, and it looks like it's actually passed down fairly undisturbed for um, the last 1,000 years. Genetic neighbors include Geraghty, York, and Reynolds. And the best fit family tree lacks detail. Um, but it is aligned with the ancient annals because many uh, people go back to Longford. Um, there's a connection with the Reynolds uh, family, which we know is of the same stock as the O'Farrells of Annalee. But there's no convincing identification of Farrell sub-branches after 1600. And that's where we are with the Farrells of Annalee. I'm going to run very quickly through the rest so we can have some time to just chat and uh, answer any questions. Farrell Group 3 is from Boat Tour, Virginia. In Virginia, Virginia, Virginia. In fact, Gabriel Farrell, Gabriel Farrell, Gabriel Farrell, they all have the same common ancestor. So these are fourth cousins, fifth cousins, sixth cousins, who all go back to this particular individual. There's also a chap here called McElgan, um, and uh, he comes up as a match. But the dominant surname variant is Farrell. Um, they, one person has done the big Y test, and another one has done a single snip. There are different surnames, but McElgan is sitting on an adjacent branch of the family tree. If you look at some additional um, data. So he's actually on a separate branch of the tree of mankind, and he is only very distantly related to the, to the other three. They came from Virginia, and probably Ireland before that. 
uh, where I didn't do the SAP exercise on this particular group. Um, the TIP report dates them to 1770, but their own pedigree goes back to 1741. Uh, what happened for the 700 years before that? How did they get the feral name? This is them on the tree of mankind. You can see Feral here, and he's surrounded by Fitzpatrick's, Leonard, Kelly, Kenny, Shalvoy, and look at the green flag, uh, the Irish flag, indicating that these all came from Ireland. So if the nearest genetic neighbors are Irish, there's a very, very good chance that these ferals also have an Irish origin. Their closest match is somebody called Boylan, which is a name that is common in County Cavan. So it could very well be that these ferals were Boylans before they became ferals, but they still have Boylan Y DNA. So that's a working hypothesis at this point in time. Um, they have eight unique SNPs and three unique SNPs, genetic distance of seven out of 111. It dates this branch at about 1100 AD as the common ancestor for the feral and the Boylan. So it's going back 900 years. Um, and then we have a date for this branch up here is 100 AD. So the nearest neighbors are mostly Irish. This group is probably Irish. They need another big Y test done and maybe wait for more people to match them. So this, for this group, it's a waiting game. They're waiting for more people to join the database and hopefully they will match these particular group. Uh, group four, or how did a pharos become a pharaoh or a pharos? Um, and this is, um, uh, this, this is the group here. You can see that the most uh, dominant surname variant is Farrell, but there's also quite a few Pharises as well. There's a Ferris, Farris, 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 and there's two Ferridges here. Ferridge. We haven't come across that name of a variant before. Um, there are uh, several different surnames here. So you can see Deerduff and Vance, um, are these um, chance matches or are they surname or DNA switches? Well, the grouping appears to be relatively consistent because there's actually relatively few mutations. This one up here, this first one, there are a lot of mutations. He shouldn't be there. I left him there for comparison purposes. He's actually an O'Farrell from Cuba. He actually doesn't have a match within the project at this point in time. Oh. But uh, there was some discussion about whether he would match the Farrells of Group 4. So I put him in there just to show that there are a lot of mutations here. And he is not a close genetic match to the other people in this group. The other thing I'm noticing here is there's a group of people here who all have this mutation of 12. Maybe they form a separate sub-branch of this particular group. I see two people here with a mutation of 15. Maybe they are on a separate sub-branch as well. Any chance matches? Well, one way of seeing whether there is a risk of having lots of chance matches is to see how many matches people have. And in actual fact, they don't have an excessive number of matches. I'm talking about maybe 200 matches at the 67 marker level. Most people would have maybe 10 or 20. If you have 200, then a lot of those are going to be chance matches. But there's no evidence of that. In fact, most of the matches, uh, I think about 30% of the matches that these people have are Farris, 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 Farris. So this is a group that actually has very, very close links with the Farris DNA project. Um, there are surname or DNA switches. In fact, this Vance member says that his most distant ancestor is a William Farrell. So there has to have been some sort of surname or DNA switch along that line. Um, the Deerduff chap has Deerduff as his most distant known ancestor, so there's no evidence of a surname or DNA switch, but it still could be possible. Where is it from? Well, Donegal, 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 Leitrim, Ulster. It seems to be around Donegal. So this could be a, a group of Donegal far Farrells slash Farrells. The pedigrees go back to 1587. The tip report suggests 1650 as the date for the common ancestor for the entire group. SNPs, um, 
we haven't been able to do any dating based on SNPs, but we have done a SAP, and it suggests that the date for the common ancestor is 950 AD, so much, so much further back than the other estimates. So it's difficult to know exactly how old this group is and how long they have been carrying the Farrell surname. This is what they look like on the big tree, and the unusual thing about this is that this is a very long branch, and it's a very ancient branch. This branching point was 2,000 years ago. The next one was 2,000 years later, 100 BC. And the next one is 1,000 years later, 1100 AD. There aren't any branches coming off this particular branch. It's a long, thin, narrow branch on the tree of mankind. It's almost as if 2,000 years ago, this guy had lots of sons. They all died out and only one managed to make it through to the present day. You're looking at a very rare branch of humanity. And that's Sam Hannah's branch, so... We should give, yeah, give it a round of applause for being such a rare human being. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you get this kind of pattern. And if you compare it with, say, the Farrells of, of Longford, where you saw a very, very wide family tree that we couldn't even get, on the page. It's a very, very different story with these ferals from the Donegal area. They have unique snips, um, 8, 4, and 14, which allow us to, to, to date this branching point as roughly 1100 AD. The nearest neighbours are a Janssen from Belgium. I think that's the Belgian flag. Janssen is certainly a Belgian name. And Virtue, which is an Irish name. There's the Irish flag. So it's a very old branch with very few neighbours. Um, we did do this uh, sap tree, and what it actually did was it split the members of this group into two separate branches. There was a branch that was dominated by the Farrell surname, and a branch that was dominated by the Farrell surname. The Farrell branch goes back to about 1650 AD, the Farrell branch goes back to about 1300 AD, and the common ancestor is about 950 AD broad brush strokes for these dates, plus or minus 300 years, okay? This dating is very inaccurate. It gives us, uh, it's statistically accurate, but genealogically inexact. But it gives us a feel that there two, are two very distinct branches to this particular group. From surname dictionaries, Ferris is an old Wiltshire name, or it's associated with West Connacht, Leitrim and Kerry, in Ulster, it's a branch of the Scottish clan Ferguson, formerly MacFergus. Ferris is found in Leitrim and Cavan. It's an anglicized form of fairy in Donegal. So you can see here that the surname dictionaries are giving us a variety of different choices about which origin these particular genetic group came from. Uh, Sam Hanna is writing a book about this group, and Sam tells us that it's going to be published hopefully sometime next month. What's the name of the book, Sam? Uh, it will be called uh, Farrells of Donegal. Farrells of Donegal. And associated families. And associated families. It does what it says on the tin. Yes. <laughs> so, really looking forward to that, because uh, Sam has put in a huge amount of work as I'm sure various members of his family will attest to. <laughs> and um, it's uh, well worth checking that out. Where will we be able to get that? It will be available on um, Amazon. Amazon, and, um, great. Good local book, bookshops as well. And, and your local bookshop uh, uh, retailers near you. So the O'Farrells of Donegal and Associated Families. And Associated Families, that's great. right. Yes. And Lovely. published by Westbo in the United States. Great, great. Um, so Farrell Group 5 is from Ireland, uh, you can see the dominant surname variant is Farley and Farrelly. Um, grouping appears to be relatively accurate. I mean, what I'm seeing here is these last two people. There's 225s, 1618 and 16. They're on definitely more closely related to each other than the rest of the group. It's probably a sub-branch of the overall group. I'm also seeing 16, 16, 16. I'm seeing three 13s here. So there's probably three sub-branches within this larger group. I'm relatively confident that they've been grouped correctly. 
But you see all the terminal SNPs are in red. It means they have not done SNP testing, so we can't be absolutely positive. SNP testing is a way of ensuring and guaranteeing that people have been correctly grouped. Um, there is a Walsh member in the family. So uh, wh what is he doing there? Is he a chance match or a surname or DNA switch? Um, there probably are a lot of chance matches because uh, these members have more than 200 matches at the 67 marker level. That's a clue that there's just lots of convergence and a lot of people are approximating their genetic signature <clears throat> just by chance. Um, they're possibly from uh, Leitrim, from uh, Meath, um, but not everybody's put in their most distant known ancestor information. Uh, the most distant known ancestor from the group is 1800. The tip tool uh, is suggesting 1620. But what happened for the 600 years before that? Where did this group come from? At this point, we don't really have any idea. Uh, which branch of the tree of mankind? Well, they haven't done any SNP testing, so we can't really say. But their close matches include BT. About 30% of their matches uh, include the name BT. Um, so this raises the question, uh, which came first, uh, the BT chicken or the Farley egg? Um, I did a, a, an analysis of the SNPs of their matches, and it's somewhere below the marker Z255. So they need to do the Z255 SNP pack or the big Y test, and of course fill in their MDK information, post their pedigrees, join the haplogroups, etc. Group 6 are descended from Brian Baru. The most dominant surname variant is Frawley, followed by Farrell. There's three of each. The original grouping was based on borderline genetic distance. Three out of 37, five out of 37, just beyond what I'd be comfortable with, and five out of 37. So um, what I've done was I, I, I divided into two groups. One group I thought I was fairly confident about. Here are their, their markers. You can see those mutations scattered throughout. And then this, these two last people here, they've got a, a value of 11 here and 16 here, which suggests that they're more closely grouped together than the rest of this group. And was the grouping accurate? No, it was not. Because uh, they did these SNP tests, big Y, a SNP pack, a SNP pack, and the new SNP results showed three different adjacent branches of the tree of mankind. Uh, here we have Z17669, DC63, and DC40. And if we look where these um, are on the tree of mankind, and this particular group, L226, Brian Baru's group, is known to have a problem with convergence. A lot of people are coming in and just matching by chance. And this is where they sit. There, there is one of them, there is another, there is another. We can date these branches you can see there's almost 700 years between uh, two of the members of this group. So they have been incorrectly group, grouped because their genetic signature looked like it was close, but in actual fact it was much further away than uh, it appeared. So that's Farrell Group 6. They came from Ireland. These last two here, uh, Tip, tip Tool is, is suggesting 1770. Um, the next steps, I need to regroup these people uh, I need to move some of them into the ungrouped section and they need to do SNP testing and it has to be big Y. With L226 and also with M222, nine of the nine hostages, there is so much chance matching that really your only hope of separating out the wheat from the chaff is to do big Y testing. Other feral groups, there are small numbers so our conclusions can only be very limited. Group seven, uh, has these three members. This is where they sit on the tree of mankind. They have this rare uh, STOR configuration of 10 and 12. Very, very few people have that. So here is where they sit um, on uh, S15280, which is somewhere around here. They sit somewhere below this. <coughs> they haven't actually, nobody's done the big Y, so they haven't uploaded to the big tree. But they're going to sit somewhere below this and you can see that their nearest genetic neighbors are probably Irish. There's an English over there, uh, British over here. 
It may be associated, and Sam used some very interesting ideas about this, but there were, the plantation of dairy happened in the early part of the 1600s, organized by the Honorable Irish Society, and I think there was a Farrell involved in that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, there were also Farrells in Wicklow by 1600, um, so it's possible that um, uh, this could be a representation of the plantation of Derry and a migration of Farrells from one part of the country into the northern part, um, because you see this person here is from London Derry. Will you be discussing that in your book, yes, Sam? Yes. Oh, you do. Uh, Great. Uh, whenever I say the Farrells of Donegal, read into that the Farrells of West Ulster. So the Donegal, West Derry, West Jerome, and Fermanagh. So there's an overlap between um, uh, you know the various counties in West Ulster associated with, it, with these groups. Great, great. Um, so that's uh, Group Seven. Now Group Eight, uh, they have the the DNA signature of Nile of the Nine Hostages M two two two, notorious for chance matches. Uh, you can see that maybe these three people here are on one branch, they've got 17 or 18 there, 31 there, and then 17 or 19 here. Um, then we have 1, 2, and 3, 12, 12, 12, 16, 16, 16. Could be another branch as well. So uh, there could be two sub branches here. Um, one of them has done the big Y, and his nearest match on the, on the family tree of mankind is a Rooney. Um, so the big Y is essential. Uh, there's too many chance matches <coughs> with people who are M222. E even with this pattern here, I would not be convinced that we would be looking at people from the same group. Well, these two subgroups, in fact, might be related 2,000 years ago. So with M222, you really cannot draw huge conclusions from the STR marker values. Farrell group nine, these are all exact matches. Look, there's no mutations at all. It's because it's a father and two sons. And they've all done the big Y test. Oh my goodness. And they're in Austria. And they go back to Austria and Slovakia. So you have three Farrells with a most distant known ancestor called Zvi. Zivi from Slovakia, um, and this is where they sit on the tree of mankind. Uh, there's the father, there's his two, he matches his two sons, which is good. <laughs> the next branch up, it's just his two sons. The next branch up, it's just his two sons. The next branch up, it's just his two sons. If we date this, there is no close match to these people for the last 1,700 years. Ooh. So very, very similar to the Farrells of Donegal, this is a thin, narrow branch of the tree of mankind with few surviving descendants from whoever that common ancestor was back in Slovakia 1,700 years ago. Oh, wow. Wow. The other thing that they've done recently is that they've done autosomal DNA testing and they have found that there was a relatively recent surname or DNA switch within the last several generations. And that has allowed them to, um, uh, th th it's, they've actually been able to pinpoint where it's likely to have occurred. But that is, this research is still ongoing. But it just goes to show you how the Farrell surname can be associated with any kind of DNA. This DNA goes back to Slovakia. We have DNA that goes back to Egypt. You know, it could come from anywhere. The other Farrell groups, 10 to 15, um, we've got, they're largely, there's Farrell, 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 Farrell. These are Fars or Farrars, and they all came from England, and there's a separate Farrar project for them. Um, then we have Farrell, Farrow appears here from England, and then two uh, Farrells. So is this, you know, which came first, the Farrow or the Farrells? Um, oh yes, I meant to say a couple of, a couple of uh, slides back. Which came first, the Farley chicken or the boiling egg? So, <laughs> I, man, I forgot to get that in. Um, so these are largely Farrells. Uh, these, the first two are Ireland, this England and then Ireland, possibly England and then Ireland. 
Uh, there's not much that you can say about these. They look to be relatively well grouped together. There aren't a hu huge amount of mutations in any of the groups, but you're only comparing two people or three people at the most. Um, the last one, only one person has done the big Y, and this is uh, this person comes from Australia, and the other one is uh, an, an O'Farrell using the old Irish Gaelic spelling. And his big Y puts him on uh, this branch here, and there he is there. Uh, he is the only one sitting there at the moment, and there needs to be another person doing the big Y test to clarify to exactly uh, where this, the person comes from. But I'm noticing that there are these, these, there's a Reynolds there, there's a McKenna, and a McDonald, and a Donnelly. I'm wondering whether that Reynolds links him to Longford. But that Reynolds and this Farrell are um, subject to the same surname or DNA switch that might have happened back when the surname was first introduced. So what we might be looking at is a very, very ancient surname or DNA switch that might have happened in the 1200s or the 1100s. And that's why we're seeing this link between Reynolds and Farrell, which we know from the Anne Lee Farrells they come from the same stock. So it would be very interesting to see how this evolves and more people join this particular group. So those are the, uh, the, the, the remaining feral groups. They may represent the smaller feral clans from Wicklow, from Tyrone, and from those other places that we saw at the start of the lecture. We need to wait for more matches for these ones. It's really a waiting game. Uh, but they should all consider SNP testing. You know, in the absence of, of people to match to, do consider doing the big Y test. So the conclusions. The Farrell DNA project continues to grow. 416 members currently, and it's growing by seven new members a month. There are 15 distinct genetic groups identified thus far. The largest is group two, the O'Farrells of Annalee. The next steps for me as administrator is to write up blog posts with all of this information over the course of the next several weeks. This is uh, going up on YouTube over the weekend, so everybody will be able to, to watch it. And I'll send John the link, and uh, he can put it up on Facebook. And then uh, the next steps for members, again, the birth location of your most distant known ancestor is essential. Post your pedigree on our Post Your Pedigree page. Join the relevant Hapla group project so those administrators can get a better overview of the O'Farrell heritage. Uh, consider big Y testing collaborate with your close matches, and have fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Sorry it took so long, but there's a lot to cover. It's a bit of a marathon. The big Y test is, big y test. The, is the expensive one. Like yes. 600. 650, yes. Oh, is it only for men? Yes. It's only for men, oh, because the Y chromosome is what we rely right, on to right, track back right, along the right, Farrell right. line. Any other questions? And is anybody interested in doing a Y DNA test? I have kits up here. If you are interested, just come up and see me. <laughs> I'll, I'll hang around anyway, so if anybody has questions, just uh, come up and we'll have a chat. Uh, for, I suppose for, for, one question, I want to, for, for ladies who haven't got a, a, a feral, a male feral relative, what, what's their best? If, if, you're a, if you're a lady, well there's a saying, behind every good Irish man, there's a good Irish woman with a knife in his back. So, <laughs> so uh, and she's saying, you will buy that DNA test, dear. <laughs> so, um, if you are a lady and you want to research Farrell line, Farrell, 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 Farrell. You're going to need Y DNA. You're going to need to find um, a, a man to act as your proxy. So if you have a male brother who carries the Farrell name, a male cousin who carries, carries the Farrell name, get them to test. If you're just interested in genealogy in general, my recommendation would be test with Ancestry, download the results to your computer, upload them for free to MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, GEDmatch, it's the most cost effective way if you're serious about genealogy. If you're not that serious and you just want to dip your toe in the water, do the Family Finder test at Family Tree DNA. It'll still give you 3,000 matches, 
all of whom are genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor sometime in the last 250 years or so, since about 1700. And then you can collaborate with them and try and figure out where do you connect. But in order to do that, you need to have characterized all of the ancestral lines in your family tree as far back as you can go. You failed to mention one option for the ladies. What's that, Bill? They can go out and make sons. They can go out and make sons. <laughs> now, Bill, how, did, how much biology did you do in school? Because how is a lady going to pass on her Y chromosome to her son? Damn. Of course a man would have asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If you go into, the, go into your DNA page on Ancestry, click on settings in the top right, and if you uh, then uh, read just down below that, there's a box saying download raw DNA data. Click on that. It will ask you to put in your password. Uh, you put that in, then it sends you an email. Then you have to click on the email and it'll start the download. Once it's downloaded, and it takes about five minutes or so, then you can uh, just go on to any of the other websites, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, GEDmatch, and then just uh, there's a button that you'll click on these and you just attach the file and then it takes about 20 minutes for that file to upload but once it's uploaded it'll churn over for about a week and then you'll have another thousand matches on this website another thousand on that another thousand on that and you never know on which website the big fish is waiting to be caught because you might have tested with one uh, company and it might be two years before you actually upload it to another website and that person's been waiting there for three years for a match and it's your first cousin that is able to give you the family bible that sends you back beyond the 1800 time point. I tested four cousins and I was stuck on my Morgan ancestor in 1800. I wrote to all the shared matches that these four cousins had, a hundred emails, and one of them came back and I was able to bring my uh, Morgan family back into Limerick in the 1600s, Wales in the 1500s, 1400s, 1300s, 1200s. I'm connected to five kings, six lords and a duck. <laughs> I think it's Duke, but it was duck. <laughs> I am a cousin of J.P. Morgan, Whoa. the American industrialist. I am a cousin of Captain Morgan on the bottle of rum. Yeah. And I am the 11th cousin of Princess Diana. Oh, wow. So much so that I was joking about this and saying to everybody, oh, I'll see you at the wedding in May. Yeah, yeah. One person I spoke to, she said, oh, that's a coincidence. I'm going and I've got a spare ticket. <laughs> Did you go? I couldn't go because I was going to Australia. Oh. Oh. So Bummer. you never know what you can find. And how many times do you need to be lucky? One. Yeah. One time, that's all. Have you had a thought about what we discussed the other day about the difficulty of if we endeavour to reach through the email contact that the, the, the DNA matching provides and they don't answer? Um, if you match somebody, yeah. you, you, you want to see what their family tree looks like. Yeah. There are several things that you can do. You can Google their email because you'll have your, their email from Family Tree DNA. And if you Google genealogy, colon, and then their email, they may have posted on a genealogical forum and put their uh, email up there. And I have located various people's trees doing that from time to time. Uh, they might have a username. If you Google the username, it may be the same as the username they use on Ancestry. So that's helped me a few times as well. Um, there's lots of ways that you can stalk people and identify who they are. So if you are going to join Facebook, and I think it's a great way of keeping in touch with people you don't want to speak to, um, then be careful about protecting your privacy and protecting your data. Never put in your real date of birth. I was born on the 1st of January 1990. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, use a false name. There's no obligation to use a real name. You can use a false name with your DNA as well. You are under no obligation to use your real name. Of course, it's useful to use your surname because that helps with genealogy. 
but you don't have to. And you, you see on Ancestry, that a lot of the matches, they're just using initials, absolutely fine. No, you're partly answered my question, but can this information be used illegally or what are the risks of how can it be used? Um, all, always a risk. Uh, you, don't, you don't know who has your data. Um, the question is, if they got hold of your data, what could they do with it? Um, if they got hold of your Y-DNA data, there's very little information on that that is uh, important. Um, it, uh, apparently, if you, some of the Y-DNA markers, they might be able to tell somebody whether you're infertile or not. But if you are of a certain age, and you, you, you'd know that already, you know. <laughs> so it's not going to tell, you know, you'd know yourself, and it's not going to tell anybody anything terribly upsetting. Um, if they got hold of your autosomal DNA data, um, how would they be able to link it back to you? Um, recently in the press, what they've, what they've, you'll read these stories about the Golden State Killer. Yeah. Uh, about Buckskin Girl, where they're actually using a JetMatch, the public database, to actually, um, uh, to, um, what's the word? To, they've got a case, the Cracker case. They've got these cases that have been going on since uh, the 1980s. Buckskin Girl was the first example. 21-year-old girl, murder victim, left on the side of the road, her body was discovered, uh, was it Arkansas or somewhere in the southern states? For 37 years, they could, ne could not identify her. And then uh, last year, they got hold of a, a blood sample that had been taken from her uh, back in 1981. Um, that it had not been refrigerated for these last 37 years. They still got DNA from it. Wow. They constructed um, a kit, the results, because your, your DNA results are downloaded in an Excel spreadsheet, more or less. And that's what they did. They created an Excel spreadsheet from the DNA results they extracted from this 37-year-old blood sample which had been stored at room temperature since 1981. Uh, they uploaded it to GEDmatch and they managed to get most of the markers they needed, uploaded it to GEDmatch. Within four hours, they had identified this girl. So after 37 years of forensic science throwing everything they had at this case, this girl was identified within four hours using genetic genealogy, what we use, and one of the public databases. They were able to uh, identify her mother, who was still living in the same house, had the same telephone number, mm -hmm. and had deliberately not changed it because she was waiting for her daughter to call oh. her. So it's amazing what the combination of DNA and genealogy can do when combined together. Um, Golden State Killer as well, they had DNA from the, from the crime scene, it, they did a lot of, uh, put it into GEDmatch, uh, identified distant cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, built loads of family trees to see where the connection might be, identified someone that could have been the killer, followed him. Uh, when he left his car, they swabbed his car handle um, because it was discarded DNA. Um, it matched the crime scene. They arrested him. They took a DNA sample and then a chain of custody. <coughs> which is very important because it's otherwise inadmissible in court. Chain of custody, the, the DNA sample was followed through the system, came back as an exact match to the DNA at the murder scene, and he's now awaiting trial, and that's the Golden State Killer. And then just last week, April Tinsley, who was an eight-year-old girl who was murdered, they used the same technique to identify a likely suspect. They asked him when they arrested him, do you have any idea what this is about? He said April Tinsley, wow. and he confessed to her killing. Wow. Oh, wow. And that's since 1980 that has gone unsolved. So we're, you're going to see more and more of these cases where they're using our DNA to build family trees to identify distant cousins that committed a crime. So that makes you a little bit cautious about your privacy and your data protection. And I say to people, it's very important to find your own level of comfort. There are no right answers, there are no wrong answers in this. The level of privacy you need is the level of privacy you're comfortable with. Um, when, they, when the Golden State Killer case came out, JetMatch allowed a lot of people to delete their DNA kits, to delete their family trees from JetMatch, and to privatize their profiles so nobody could identify them. A lot of people did. 
but 100,000 people joined JetMatch because they wanted to be part of the solution. So, you know, it swings and roundabouts. You know, and you have to keep your eye on privacy and data protection all the time because it's never going to go away. It's never like we've conquered privacy and now we can forget about it. No. Ever since they introduced the phone book in 1957 and people were going, it's the end of privacy as we know it. <laughs> Everybody's in the phone book now. How many people were on CCTV as they walked into the library today? We were all on closed circuit television. But the civil libertarians were up in arms a couple of years ago when they first uh, introduced the idea of having CCTV on the streets. But now it's acceptable to everybody. So public attitudes to privacy and data protection will change and will evolve just like the Farrells have. As Mara says, if you carry one of these, it's a tracking device. Yeah. 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 They yeah. know where you are. So you, have to leave, you have to have a comfort yeah. level. Which they can trace you anyway. Yeah. Big brother is watching you. <laughs> Hopefully he's a nice big brother. Right. And you haven't done anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, and again, Facebook, Facebook used our data to perhaps manipulate uh, the presidential election in the US. So again, it swings and roundabout. Google have been fined three billion, was it? Three billion dollars? You know, so we need to be vigilant. Uh, but we should not be so scared that it drives us into the cupboard. Right. So, that answers the question. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank, thank you, Morris. That, that was uh, very informative. I'm sure uh, anyone that connects with you on Facebook or, or through your blogs or whatever on, on, on Family Tree DNA will, will probably do so. I hope you found it useful for anyone that hasn't explored DNA yeah there, there, are, there are obviously things you have to think about before you do it um, from a personal point of view it, 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 it confirmed a few things that I thought were probably uh, in my family history it, it, it's opened an awful lot more questions but uh, mm. you know uh, genealogy is, 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 is often you answer one question or you find a little bit of information and I ask you ten more questions. So it's, it's a never-ending process. But it's like grey hairs, John. Really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there, there is a, there's a level of enjoyment, and I mean, I, I enjoy it mainly. I think uh, for for the people I meet, and and uh, you know, events like this, it adds another dimension, and it's uh, you know, gives you a, gives you a good feeling, I think. And as I say, regardless of where your feral DNA or your feral name came from, we're, we're happy to have you here. So that's, that's the main thing. A feral by any other name would smell as sweet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we'll, uh, we'll see some of you at 2 o'clock for our tree planting ceremony, which is uh, where we opened opposite the council offices. There's a little peace garden there. So at 2 o'clock, we're meeting there. Uh, just to remember some of our past members and and parents who are up there somewhere. <laughs> the ancestors. The ancestors, okay. So thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.